nice to see everybody out here. I'm not sure I, I got the ear music that you was talking about, but we will do our best. Uh, I wanted to talk about the imagination uh, a little bit before I launch into, into the poems. I think the imagination is the fastest element of human consciousness, the fastest animal in the great wilderness of the human mind. If reason is the steady wildebeest, imagination is the cheetah. If deduction stands on an elephant's fat feet, intuition sits on a hummingbird's back. And though we live by sight, smell, sounds, taste, textures, emotions, language is the high octane fuel of our imaginative power, the high priest of the heart. Now I'm making hard line ass assertions. I love all kinds of things, but I do love poems. And with this as a starting point, um, a trampoline, I guess I'd like to call it, I'd like to make a case for poems as the sharpest edge of language, as a valuable tool of human consciousness. I was talking about uh, how easily we forget language because we live inside it every day. I was talking to someone during lunch. We live inside words all the time and we take them for granted, but words are magic and they're strange. They allow us to move so quickly between feelings and ideas. And, and visions, but we take it for granted because they're with us all the time for the most part, you know. Anyway, and poetry, I think, exists as a reminder of what words can do. Start off with a poem called What Bugs Bunny Said to Red Riding Hood. <laughs> Say good looking. What brings you out this away amongst the fanged and the fluffy? Grandma, huh? Some old bag too lazy to pick up a pot, too feeble to flip a flapjack, and you all dolled up like a fire engine to cruise these woods? This was your mother's idea? She been living in a Cracker Jack box or something? This is a tough neighborhood, mutton chops. You got your badgers, your wild boar, your hardcore grizzlies. And lately, this one wolf's been acting pretty big and bad. I mean, what's up, Doc? <laughs> Didn't anybody ever tell you it ain't smart to stick out in wild places? Friendly? You want friendly, you better try Detroit. I mean, you're safe with me, sweet cakes, but I ain't a meat eater. You heard about Goldilocks, didn't you? Well, didn't you? Yeah, well, little Miss Sunshine, little Miss I'm so much cuter than V, got caught on one of her sneaky porridge runs, and the three bears weren't in the mood. So last week, the game warden nabs baby bear, passing out her fingers to his pals. That's right. Maybe your mother should turn off her soaps, take a peek at a newspaper, turn on some cartoons for Pete's sake. This world is about teeth, bubble buns. Who's biting and who's getting bit? The noiva that broad sending you out here looking like a ripe tomato. Why don't she just hang a sign around your neck? Get over here and bite my legs off. Cover me with mustard, call me a hot dog. All right, all right, I'll stop. Listen, Doc, I'd hate for something unpleasant to find you out here all alone. Grandma Schmanma, let her call Domino's. They're paid to deliver. Besides, toots, it's already later than you think. Get a load of that chubby moon up there. You can't count on Casper tonight either. They ran that potato head out of town two months ago trying to make friends all the time. He makes you sick after a while. Look, Cinderella, I got some candles and some cold uncola back at my place. What do you say? Got any artichokes in that basket? You know, we can move so fast with words. Um, just for a moment, you know, we get to enter the mind 
perhaps a little tilted, but of the mind of Bugs Bunny. And if we think about it, a poem is a relatively small thing. I was listening to a gentleman this morning talk about how huge the, I guess, the spaceships would have to be to get people on, to, on Mars. And I was thinking, but a poem is a very small, light thing. And you can go so many places so quickly with a poem, and we forget about that all the time. Anyway, this is a poem called uh, Dolores Epps, and it's a poem of memory, of recollection. I imagine it will um, inter intersect in some ways with uh, some of your own memories. Dolores Epps. It seems insane now, but she'd be standing soaked in school day morning light, her loose leaf notebook flickering at the bus stop, and we almost trembled at the thought of her mouth, filled for a moment with both of our short names. I don't know what we saw when we saw her face, but at 15, there's so much left to believe in that a girl with sunset in her eyes, with a kind smile and a bright blue mini skirt softly shading her bare thighs, really could be the goddess. Even the gloss on her lips sighed, kiss me, and you'll never do homework again. <laughs> Some Saturdays, my ace, Terry, would say, guess who was buying tea berry gum in the drugstore on Stinton? And I could see the sweet epiphany still stunning his eyes. And I knew that he knew that I knew, he knew, I knew. <laughs> Especially once summer had come and the sun stayed up till we had nothing else to do but wish and wonder about fine sisters in flimsy culottes and those hot pants James Brown screamed about. Crystal Berry, Diane Ramsey, Kim Graves, and her. This was around 1970. Vietnam to the left of us, black Muslims to the right, big Afros all over my Philadelphia. We had no idea where we were, how much history had come before us, how much cruelty, how much more dying was on the way. For me and Terry, it was a time when everything said maybe. And maybe being blinded by the beauty of a 10th grader was proof that, for a little while, we were safe from the teeth that were chewing up the world. I'd like to commend my parents for keeping calm, for not quitting their jobs or grabbing guns, and for never letting up about the amazing, quote, so many doors open to good students, unquote. I wish I had kissed Dolores Epps. I wish I had some small memory of her warm and spicy mouth to wrap these hungry words around. I would like to have danced with her, to have slow cooked to a slow song in her sleek, toffee arms. Her body balanced between the temptation's five voices and me, a boy anointed with puberty a kid with a B average and a cool best friend. I don't think I've ever understood how lonely I am, but I was closer to it at 15 because I didn't know anything. My heart so near the surface of my skin, I could have moved it with my hand. Speaking, and speaking of, of romance, this is a poem um, called First Kiss. Um, and it's not necessarily the first kiss in your life, but the first kiss of any particular romance. When, uh, when the brain is undone by such a kiss, you know what I mean. It's dedicated to lips because everybody's got some kind of lips, yeah? All right. First kiss. Her mouth fell into my mouth like a summer snow. 
like a fifth season, like a fresh Eden. Like Eden when Eve made God whimper with the liquid tilt of her hips. Her kiss hurt like that. I mean, it was as if she'd mixed the sweat of an angel with the taste of a tangerine. I swear, my mouth had been a helmet forever greased with secrets. My mouth a dead-end street, a little bit lit by teeth. My heart a clam slammed shut at the bottom of a dark. But her mouth pulled up like a baby blue Cadillac packed with canaries, driven by a toucan. <laughs> I swear, those lips said bright wings when we kissed, wild and precise, as if she were teaching a seahorse to speak. Her mouth, so careful, chumming the first vowel from my throat until my brain was a piano banged loud, hammered like that. It was like, I swear, her tongue was Saturn's seventh moon, hot like that hot and cold and circling, circling, turning me into a glad planet, sun on one side, night pouring her slow hand over the other, one fire flying the kite of another, her kiss. I swear, if the great mother rushed open the moon like a gift and you were there to feel your shadow finally unhooked from your wrist, that'd be it but even sweeter, like a riot of peg-legged priests on pogo sticks. Up and up, this way and this, not falling, but on and on, like that, badly behaved, but holy, I swear. That kiss, both lips utterly committed to the world, like a peace corps, like a free store, forever and always a new city, no locks, no walls, just doors. Like that, I swear, like that. <laughs> yeah, poems can, poems can, you know, certainly run out of bounds on you, can't they? But the thing is, when you think about poetry, when you think about language, and I won't go on about it, but um, if you think uh, um, about the, the kind of uh, intuition and the magic that, that accompanies a saxophone solo or like the guitar solos my man from the Living Daylights was doing, I mean, it's coming from a place where we know more than we know, you know? And this is why I think, when I think about what's next, I like to think that poetry is like the vanguard of a rediscovery of language, the magic of language, the fact that we live inside it all the time. We live inside this kind of magic castle all the time, but we don't know it, you know? But I think poetry can remind us of that, and we can see more clearly, perhaps, if we resurrect our sense of language and what it might mean. And I'll leave you with this poem. It's a short poem. It's called Something Silver White. Um, it grows from a meditation uh, of being outdoors one night, just looking at the sky. Last night, I saw the moon and remembered the earth is also just a rock riding the infinite dark wave of space that somewhere else deep down in the Milky Way, someone very different could look up from a garden to see something silver white candling faintly above a hilltop and think that dull star seems so weary near the rest, not knowing that all of us are living on that small taste of light, buying food, calling friends, killing each other, and sometimes staring back into the speckled blackness. You know, you can spend your whole life glancing at your watch, while everything mysterious does everything mysterious, the way gravity keeps all of us close to the ground. It is hard to believe this huge wet stone is always flying through space, and hard to admit there's really nothing to hold on to. While we build houses and fences, 
in thousands of churches as though this globe were just a fat blossom atop some iron stalk grown from God's belly. After sailing this blue ark so many years together, you might think we would be kinder because no matter what anybody says about anybody else, we were all born to this planet, suddenly blinking under the same star. And the evening sky means the universe is floating.